Welcome to our video lecture on topic 11.3 spectroscopy. Our essential understanding has a lot of words, and so we're just going to focus on the fact that spectroscopy is an analytical technique. That means that we use spectroscopy to figure out what kinds of molecules we have in samples, what functional groups are in those molecules. Um, we're literally analyzing our samples. So welcome to spectroscopy. Our objectives, we're going to define and practice some index of hydrogen deficiency. We're going to review electron transitions. We're going to describe and apply infrared spectroscopy. We're going to look at proton and MR spectroscopy. And then we're going to wrap up with a look at mass spectrometry. We did this back in um, the first semester. This time, though, we're going to look at molecules in the mass spec instead of just isotopes of atoms. If you don't already have your data booklet nearby, I highly recommend that you grab it. We're going to be looking at a lot of tables to do some analysis of data. So first up, we're going to look at IHD index of hydrogen deficiency. Index of hydrogen deficiency. Basically, we're looking at how unsaturated a molecule is. Saturation versus unsaturation. We're talking about the hydrogens that are in the molecule. So if I'm looking at this alkane, I have just about as many hydrogens as I can possibly squeeze into that molecule. This guy, this alkene, though, this double bond, means that I took out some hydrogens. If I had ethane instead of ethene, I could squeeze in one, two, three, four, five, six carb or sorry, six hydrogens. This ethene molecule only has four. So I have removed a couple hydrogens when I made that double bond. That makes this unsaturated. So in IHD, we have some degrees of unsaturation depending on the special things that remove hydrogens from the molecule. A double bond has a degree of one because I'm taking out one pair of hydrogens. Triple bonds take out two pairs, so the degree of unsaturation is two. And then rings, kind of like double bonds, um, is a degree of unsaturation of one. So if I'm looking at this guy, I've got one, two, three double bonds. So I have one, two, three from these double bonds degrees of unsaturation. Then I also have a ring. So the total degree of unsaturation duration is going to be 3 plus 1 equals 4. So our IHD is going to be 4. This molecule, I only have this one double bond, and so the IHD, that index of hydrogen deficiency, is only 1. Here, two double bonds, no rings, no triples. IHD is going to be 2 because I get 1 from each of those double bonds. This is aspirin. There's a lot going on over here. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 double bonds. Each of those double bonds adds a 1 to that degree of unsaturation. And I also have that one ring. So I'm going to add one more. And so our total IHD index of hydrogen deficiency is equal to 6. There's also this formula, which I don't know why anyone <laughs> would want to use. But if you want to memorize it, you can. Uh, so if you would rather not count double, triple, bonds and rings, you can always apply this formula. One half of two times the carbons plus two minus the number of hydrogens minus the number of halogens, that X is for halogens, plus the number of nitrogens is going to give us the IHD. So if I'm looking at this molecule, I could do one half times two times the number of carbons is four, plus two minus the number of hydrogens is eight, minus the halogens, there are zero plus the nitrogens, there are zero. And so I could tally that up one half times eight plus two is 10 minus eight is two and those zeros don't do anything. So one half of two is one. IHD is equal to one. Or you could just draw it and count things. So here's a practice problem from a former former released IB exam looking for the IHD index of hydrogen deficiency of this molecule 3 methylcyclohexene. I see one double bond. I see one ring. That makes an IHD of two. Easy peasy. So now we're going to flip over to some actual spectroscopy. This is how uh, we're looking at how matter interacts with radiation. Radiation, the electromagnetic spectrum is here. I have short wavelengths, high frequency, high energy. So the shorter the wavelength, 
the higher the energy. When I have these crazy long lazy wavelengths, I have less energy and a lower frequency. So we have low energy over here, high energy over here, visible light here in the, well, not exactly the middle, but the middle-ish. So we're going to look at this uh, radiation, different kinds of this radiation and how matter interacts with different chunks of the electromagnetic spectrum. These are the different kinds of electromagnetic spectrum that we're going to look at. UV radiation, which is slightly more energetic than visible light. IR radiation, which is slightly less energetic than visible light. Radio waves, a lot less energetic than visible light. And then we're going to also look at mass spec in magnetic fields. First step, let's talk about UV spectroscopy. This we actually did um, back in the first semester. That should be a lowercase u for ultraviolet. Ultraviolet radiation leads to electron transitions. Remember that electrons can jump between energy levels. This was one of the big things that Bohr figured out for us. Um, and so this the, the um, flame test lab showed us how we have different colors of visible light as those electrons are falling down to energy level number two. So this question is asking us to remember some of those thing, things from first semester. So we're going to draw the first four energy levels of a hydrogen atom on the axis labeling N1234, N is those energy levels. Remember that energy levels, as they go further away from the nucleus, get closer and closer to each other. So when you draw n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, make sure that you are decreasing the space between those energy levels. And then we're going to show electron transitions to n equals 2 in emission spectrum. So we're going from higher energy levels down to energy level number 2. And here's 4 to 2, and here's 3 to 2, and that's about all we can do if we're only doing energy levels 1 through 4. Emission spectrum, arrows going down to energy level number 2, and the reason that we love energy level number 2 is because these are the transitions that are visible to our eyeballs. It's in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So now we're going to look at IR spectroscopy, infrared radiation is slightly less energetic than is visible light. What's kind of cool about infrared radiation is it does cause some kinds of bonds to vibrate, and they vibrate in different ways. And we can detect those vibrations with computers, and those vibrations are different in different functional groups. So the cool thing about IR spectroscopy is that we can find functional groups. IR spectroscopy allows us to figure out what functional groups are in different compounds. The energy required for these vibrations that are caused by the infrared radiation depend on bond enthalpies, and we'll talk about that in uh, a unit coming up very, very soon. The IR radiation is going to be absorbed by these bonds, which then leads to that vibration of the bonds, um, and we're going to measure in the reciprocal of wavelength centimeters to the minus one power, one over centimeters. It's just how that infrared radiation is being absorbed by these molecules, by the bonds. Um, and it's all about changes in these dipole-dipole moments. Remember that this is one of our intermolecular forces. Good. Here's just a quick look at some of the ways that bonds can vibrate. We can have a bending thing where the, the center molecule kind of goes up and down, or we can have some stretching where these guys will maybe stretch out and then pop back in and then stretch out again. They can do that symmetrically or they can do that asymmetrically and depending on how these guys are vibrating we can figure out what kinds of um, functional groups are in a compound so we can look at section 26 of our data booklet so hopefully you grabbed yours you have it ready so section 26 shows us what different functional groups align with these different um, regions these different absorptions so this absorption of like 2,900 to 3,000 usually indicates that there's some CH bonds in a molecule. This um, absorbance here, right around 1,700, between 17 and 1,750, is telling us there's probably a carbonyl group somewhere in there. The functional group region tends to be a little higher in our reciprocals of some centimeters. The fingerprint region tends to be super messy, and we don't spend a whole lot of time analyzing this um, 
unless you're matching to a known molecule, in which case it might be super helpful. But for us, we're going to spend most of our time in the functional group region. So here is table 26. So again, I'm looking at this CH, and I can see CH is here, that 2850 to 3090 absorbance. Notice that this is right in that 2800 to 3000. So super close to that same wavelength number that's given to us in table number 26. This one, the C00 is here. There's 15, 16, 17, 1800. So right between 1700 and 1800, 1750 ish. And notice that C00 these carbonyl groups are right there at 1700 to 1750. The intensity is going to be like how big of a dip, how big of an absorb absorbance do we see? So stronger is usually going to be these dips that go all the way down to the bottom of the, um, well, up and down to the, the um, along the y-axis of the graph. Um, Notice that some of them are more medium and we'll see multiple bands, kind of like this would be maybe something like this. So use table 26 and it'll help us figure out what functional groups are in a molecule. Infrared spectroscopy, we're causing bonds to vibrate and that tells us what functional groups, what functional groups are in molecules. Now we're gonna look at proton NMR nuclear magnetic resonance. So in um, proton and NMR, what we're looking at is radio waves in magnetic fields are actually causing the nuclei of protons to flip around. And so we have this um, hydrogen atom. It's proton because a hydrogen atom has just that one proton. So that proton is going to be spinning in a certain way. And if we send it through this crazy strong magnetic field in this proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, what happens sometimes is it's going to flip from this way to this way. So our spin is going to um, shift a little bit and then it's gonna kind of pop back up and we can detect with our computers these shifts and how the protons are flipping around, how they're spinning. We have a table for that. So table 27 in your data booklet is going to show you how these flips of our protons are going to align with the data that we can collect from a proton or hydrogen nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, the different shifts in our different hydrogens are coming from hydrogens in different environments. So I can look at what kind of hydrogens we have, what are our hydrogens bonded to, and this is what we can figure out in proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Here's a really detailed mm, graphic kind of showing us these different shifts. So the, the hydrogens in different environments will shift differently. And by environment, I mean a hydrogen that is bonded to an oxygen in an ester group, or hydrogens that are bonded to a nitrogen in an amido group, or hydrogens that are bonded to carbons, triple bonded to other carbons. So we have hydrogens in lots of different environments. They're bonded to different things that are bonded to different things. And depending on this environment of this hydrogen is going to shift in different ways, and then we're going to get these peaks in different places. Here is an example of some proton nuclear magnetic resonance data. We had some hydrogens that were shifting around, and this guy happened to shift pretty close to 1.9 ppm. And so if I look at my uh, chemical shift in PPM table number 27 in my data booklet, and I try to find some place 1.9, notice that this range gives us 1.9, and I've got a hydrogen bonded to a carbon, triple bonded to a carbon. So the other cool thing about this particular graph, I have only one peak. That means that all of the hydrogens are bonded to carbons that are triple bonded to carbons which means that this molecule has to be 
whoa, that was a triple bond, not a quadruple bond. This molecule has to be ethyne. If it were anything else, if it was propyne, if it looked like this, and I'm talking about this hydrogen bonded to a carbon, triple bonded to another carbon, if I had more carbons in this chain, then I would have these hydrogens that are bonded to a carbon that are single bonded to a carbon. And that would look like this. And then I would see a shift way down here. And since I don't have that, since all of my hydrogens are in this 1.9 ppm, that means all of my hydrogens are bonded to a carbon that are triple bonded to a carbon, which means that this has to be ethyne. Cool beans, right? So this question, sample IB question, asking us about proton NMR spectrum of pentan 3 all. We're going to go ahead and draw this and look at our different hydrogen environments. Pent means five carbons. One, two, three, four, five. I don't have any double or triple bonds, but I do have a hydroxyl group on carbon number three. So I'm going to do OH. Everything else is going to be a hydrogen. So I'm going to fill in lots and lots of hydrogens while my laundry sings at us. I don't know if you can hear that or not. <laughs> Anyhow, so here are all our hydrogens bonded to carbons in our pentan 3 all molecule. So now we need to figure out the different signals, these different peaks that we're going to get from the different kinds of hydrogens. We definitely have hydrogens that are bonded to a carbon, that are bonded to only one carbon. I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six hydrogens that are bonded to a carbon, and that carbon is also bonded to one carbon. So I have six hydrogens in this kind of environment. We also have hydrogens bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. This hydrogen is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two carbons and a hydrogen. This hydrogen is bonded to a carbon that is bonded to two carbons and a hydrogen. Same for these two guys. So I have four hydrogens that are bonded to carbons that are bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. This hydrogen and this hydrogen are each bonded to a carbon that is bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. You might be thinking, wait, what about this hydrogen? Isn't it also bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two carbons? Yes, except this carbon is also bonded to an oxygen, which is different. So this hydrogen, one hydrogen, is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two carbons and an oxygen. We have one more hydrogen waiting to be found, this guy. We have one hydrogen that is bonded to an oxygen that's bonded to a carbon. So when it's asking us for the ratio of the areas of the signals, it's basically saying what kinds of signals are we going to see and how tall are they? So we should have six hydrogens, which are going to give a ratio of six to four. Pretend like that's six tall and that's about four tall. And then I have one and one. These are each about one tall because I have six hydrogens in this environment and four hydrogens in this environment and one in each of these environments. So our ratio of the areas are going to be six to four to one to one because I have six hydrogens in one environment, four in another, one in one and one in that last one. So our answer is gonna be A. Now, I didn't necessarily put these guys in the right place along the x-axis, but that doesn't really matter for this question. We're just looking for how tall, which is how many hydrogens are in each environment, how many different environments. And our answer is going to be A. All right, here's another example of hydrogen nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Xylene is a derivative of benzene. One isomer is one four dimethylbenzene how many different signals. So here, I don't necessarily need the ratio. I don't need to know how many, how tall, how many hydrogens in each environment. We just need to know how many different hydrogen environments are there. These hydrogens are bound to a carbon, bound to the ring. 
these three hydrogens are also bound to a carbon, also bound to the ring. So these guys are in the same kind of, same kind of environment. So I've got six hydrogens here. Is that it? Is there only one signal? Do I only have these six hydrogens in the whole entire molecule? Be careful because remember that all of these C's on these vertices need four bonds. And our ring here is kind of like a double and then a single and then a double and then a single and then a double and then a single. It's not really, but this is a good way for us to kind of count carbons and hydrogens. So this carbon here has a single bond and a double bond. That's only one, two, three bonds. He needs a hydrogen to balance out to four. This guy also needs a hydrogen, he needs a hydrogen, and he needs a hydrogen. This carbon does not, because he has one, two, three, four. This carbon has one, two, three, ooh, two, three, four. I was not counting my singles and doubles very well. Um, so these guys don't need hydrogens because they have the methyl groups instead. But I do have these four hydrogens sticking out here. One, two, three, four. All of these hydrogens are bound to a carbon that are bonded to other carbons in the ring. And so I have four hydrogens in that environment. It doesn't matter that I've got six and four. All I need to know here is how many different environments are there? How many signals will I see in my data, um, in my graph? How many signals will there be? There will be two, because I have two different hydrogen environments. Good. Good. If they had asked us for the ratio of the areas of the signals, then we would have a six to four, but that's not what I need. For this question, I just need two. Last chunk of the day, mass spec. So here's spectrometry instead of spectroscopy. So instead of looking at what bonds are in a molecule, what functional groups, what hydrogens. Now we're going to look at masses. And so it's a little bit more quantitative. We're measuring, hence the M, instead of looking like in the scopy. So anyhow, what we're going to do, mass spec, kind of like what we did back last semester, looking at isotopes. So we're going to use our mass spectrometer. We're going to vaporize our sample. We're going to ionize it. We're going to blast electrons off of it so it has a charge. We're going to accelerate it and then pass it through this electromagnet. Because they have charges, because of that ionization, they're going to be deflected by that magnetic field. Positive things are going to be de, um, repelled by the positive field of the magnet and attracted to the negative field of the magnet. So here's negative and here's positive and our things are going to be like boom, 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 boom. Things that are lighter have a little bit less momentum. They're going to be deflected more. They're easier to push around. Things that are heavier, it's harder for us to push them. It's harder to deflect them. And so we can separate by mass these different isotopes. And that's the kind of data that I have here. We can detect the masses of the isotopes when they hit the end of the mass spec. So this one is looking at, I've got these two peaks here and here. So I have just a few isotopes with a mass of 10 and a lot of isotopes with mass of 11. And then I could do like a relative comparison of the heights of these two peaks, um, um, these two masses, and then I could figure out um, what our what our relative atomic mass is. We can find that weighted average of the masses of the isotopes. What's super cool is that I can do the same thing with molecules. So instead of just throwing some atoms with isotopes into the mass spec, we can put whole entire molecules in there. Same process, we're gonna vaporize it, we're gonna, so it's a gas, we have to have a gas. We're gonna ionize it, it needs to have a charge. That's that M plus, we've gotta have that plus, um, that charge in order to get it to be deflected in the magnet. We're going to accelerate it, boom, boom, boom. There it goes into the magnetic field, the electromagnet. It's going to be attracted to negative things, repelled by the positive side of the electromagnetic field. And then we're going to get deflections of pieces of the molecules. 
So often the molecules will break apart. And then we have these fragments of the molecules. They tend to break apart in specific places. And then we can use that fragmentation pattern to figure out the pieces and parts that we have in these molecules. What's kind of cool though, not all of the molecules break apart. They often do, but not always. And so the greatest mass, the mass furthest to the right, is going to give us the molecular mass. So the molecular mass of this compound is 16 grams per mole because this is our heaviest mass. Notice that I've got a peak also at 15 and at 14 and at 13 and at 12. This, my friends, is methane, CH4. This, 16, that's methane, CH4. Sometimes a hydrogen gets blown off and what's left is CH3, which would be 12 plus 3 makes 15. And sometimes two hydrogens get blown off and we're left with CH2 and that would have a mass of 14. And sometimes three hydrogens get blown off and we're left with only one hydrogen on that carbon and that has a mass of 13. And then of course, sometimes we have carbon all by itself and that's gonna have a mass of 12. Cool beans, right? Notice that there's a tiny, tiny little dip right here at 17. What is that, CH5? Nope, this is probably carbon 13, the isotope of carbon 13 um, in that methane molecule. Or we could have deuterium hydrogen too, but more likely that carbon 13. Crazy sauce, right? And you probably guessed that we have a table in the data booklet to look at mass spec data. We do. So uh, table number 28 is our mass spectral fragments lost. Um, and this is kind of common sense. It's just saying that if I've got a 15 um, mass per charge ratio lost in our data, it's probably a methyl group because carbon is 12 and hydrogen is each one. There are three of them that adds up to 15. And if I have a chunk that's a 17 mass that gets blown off in the mass spec, it's probably oxygen, which has a, a mass of 16 and hydrogen is one that makes 17. So this makes a lot of sense. Um, so if I'm looking at this piece of mass spec data, and I know that the molecule has an empirical formula of CH2, and I wanna figure out the formula of the molecular ion from this mass spectrum data, I'm going to find the peak of the greatest mass, which is going to be the one furthest to the right. And in this instance, it looks like 56. So M per Z is just mass per charge, and we're assuming that the charge is a plus one because it was ionized in the mass spec. So our molar mass is gonna be 56 over one, or 56 grams per mole. CH2 is 12 plus one plus one, that's a 14 gram per mole empirical mass. If I do 56 divided by 14, we're going to get four. That means that our, um, Oh gosh, scale factor. Oh, I lost those words. Scale factor is equal to four. So if I do four times CH2, we're going to get a molecular formula. The formula of the molecular ion is going to be C4H8. Since they're asking us for the ion, we're gonna add that plus charge in there. It doesn't have that positive charge in order to be deflected in the mass spec machine. Let's go ahead and look at some of the other data that's given to us in this data, um, in this graph. So I'm noticing from 56 to 41, 56 minus 41, that's a mass difference of 15. It's probably a methyl group got blown off of this molecule. I'm noticing from 41 to, let's do that, 27. So that's a difference of 14. That's probably a carbon and two hydrogens. Notice this peak here at 15. That's probably the methyl group that got blown off from here to here. So kind of cool that we can look at these pieces and parts, figure out what molecule we have.
All right, so quick review of all the different kinds of spectroscopy that we talked about today. Um, I'm actually going to throw in index of hydrogen deficiency. We did talk about that. This is just looking at double bonds and triple bonds and rings to figure out how unsaturated a molecule is. UV radiation um, is going to lead to some electron transitions like we saw in the flame test lab. Infrared radiation is going to cause bonds to vibrate. That's going to help us find functional groups. Radio waves in proton nuclear magnetic resonance um, spectroscopy, they're going to help us figure out those hydrogen environments. So hydrogen environments in our radio wave and MR studies. And then, of course, we've got mass spectrum. Oh, this should be spectrometry. Let's fix that mass spectrometry. We're looking at molecular mass, and we can also look at the masses of fragments of molecules. We can put all that together and figure out what compounds are in our samples. Objectives have been met. We defined and practiced some index of hydrogen deficiency. We looked at electron transitions. We looked at infrared spectroscopy and proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and then we wrapped up with our mass spec. We did it. Good work.